Okay, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Andrea Schaefer. I'm a professor of energy and transport at the UCL Energy Institute, and I'm running the Air Transportation Systems Lab. And it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce a very dear and close colleague of mine, Lynette Dre. We have been collaborating for 13 years or so. It seems like forever. <laughs> uh, Lynette is a, is a brilliant uh, researcher, and she is uh, the lead modeler of uh, our, the backbone of all of our analysis, the aviation integrated model. And she's going to talk about this uh, today, so I won't, I won't lose myself in here. And she's a senior research uh, associate uh, at the Energy Institute and, uh, of course, at the Air Transportation Systems Lab. Her background is in astrophysics with a PhD at the University of Cambridge. And uh, she has moved from the outer atmosphere to, to the inner. But uh, the problems have not become simpler, I, I suppose. Um, she, she has many interests uh, uh, work-wise, and I won't read them off, but she is also, as I know, uh, she is very interested in classical music and many other interesting things, so she is not a, 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 a narrow-minded researcher, not at all. She has a very broad interest. And, uh, but uh, before the net is actually going to start, I have to uh, convey a couple of very exciting housekeeping rules. Um, there's no fire alarm schedule, so, so if the alarm goes off, uh, well, we are in an aviation presentation, the closest exit may be behind you. And I think that's, that's the case, James, right? People have to go uh, through the door where you are. Um, there's no guarantee that your belongings will still be around if you, if you, if you um, um, lose them out of your sight. We can't take any guarantee. There's no security system in that regard. So uh, watch, watch them. Um, there's also a reception uh, at the end uh, of this presentation in the uh, room behind James, so the next room here. Uh, so we are, you are most welcome to attend, and uh, you may have many more questions to our speaker than uh, you may ask uh, during that hour or so. Um, uh, but we are to f about to finish around 7.30, and then it's in your interest to leave the building quickly unless you want to spend the night in here. And I think uh, that's all I have to say. Uh, so thank you very much, and Lynette, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction, and thank you all for coming along to this presentation. One thing to note, first of all, before I start, I'm going to be presenting the work, um, work done by a lot of other people in the UCL Air Transportation Systems Lab. I will try and name check them as I go along, and there'll be a big list of them at the end. So, low carbon aviation. Um, I'm going to divide this talk into a few bits. First of all, why should we care about low carbon aviation? And you've all come to this talk, so you probably have your own ideas. Secondly, um, how can we um, model what we think aviation is going to do in the future, how we think aviation emissions are going to change, and the impacts of technologies and policies on that. And then I'm going to go through a few technologies which have the potential to make a large difference in at least per flight aviation emissions in future. And then I'm going to show what some of the things that we've done in trying to model these technologies, both in terms of how a given technology might come into the system and also what a technology might need to look like to get into the system. So, first of all, why look at reducing aviation emissions? Currently, aviation accounts for about, oh, well, less than 3% of global energy use related CO2 and the non-CO2 climate impacts associated with aviation, so for example from contrails or NOx emitted at altitude, are more uncertain but maybe roughly equal to that. Uh, this figure down here is from the European Environment Agency. This is between 1990 and 2016, um, CO2 equivalent by source. So you can see aviation is this tiny little line down here at the bottom, but aviation emissions are going up and this contrasts with many of the other sources <coughs> of CO2, which are going down. So, aviation currently is only a small proportion of global CO2. The main issue is that it's increasing and it's projected to carry on increasing. So, if you look at global demand rates in terms of passenger kilometres, um, Airbus and Boeing 
forecast that they are likely to continue going up for the next 20 years or so at about 4 to 5% per year. And they have at least some interest in being right because they need to know how many aircraft to plan to make. In terms of how much you can reduce emissions per passenger kilometre, um, there are a couple of studies that we've done recently looking at um, getting together all of the different ways you think you can reduce emissions that are at least fairly likely. And we were seeing you know, maybe about 2 to 3% per year reductions in fuel life cycle CO2 per passenger kilometre. So if you take those two together, and that 2 to 3% per year includes a lot of different things, um, emissions are going to carry on going up. This is just to put the demand growth in perspective. You may not be able to see this too well um, until it flips back around to the end, but this is an animation. So this is demand growth for aviation between the year 2000 and 2016. Um, the colour is just um, dividing by flight distance. Um, line thickness gives you an idea of the frequency. You can see that generally not too much is happening in North America. There's a bit of growth, not too much. A little bit more is happening in Europe. And most of the growth is happening in Middle East and Asia. Uh, it's going to flip back around to the start again, so you should be able to see the difference between 2016 and 2000, which is pretty much largely here. But also, you can see there's also been a lot of growth in long-haul flights in particular. And that's one of the trends that's um, projected to continue. Uh, I'll let that get to 2016 again. I carry on. You can also see the passenger kilometres here have more than doubled <coughs> over that time period. So, how is the international community looking at dealing with this? Um, International shipping and aviation are outside the Paris Agreement, and they are specifically outside the Paris Agreement so as to allow the international bodies that specifically deal with them, uh, which in aviation's case is the um, body ICAO, to come up with their own um, schemes for reducing emissions. And for aviation, ICAO has come up with a scheme called Corsia, the idea behind Corsia is that participating, uh, participating airlines buy offsets from other sectors um, for any CO2 increase above levels in the year 2020. And this is intended to be um, a limited term thing. It's intended to phase out if and when aviations are able to reduce their own emissions within sector. If flights are within the EEA, the EU ETS also applies and that is somewhat stricter. However, these are still only um, aimed at carbon neutral growth and they're not really aimed at reducing emissions within the system so much as um, making sure that offsets occur via reductions in emissions in other sectors. So if you compare emissions targets, emissions targets across all sectors are significantly more ambitious. So for example, this is from the EU 2050 low carbon economy strategy. This is looking at reducing greenhouse gases um, by 80% between 1990 and 2050. And you can see here that, for example, emissions from the power sector um, predicted to go down to basically zero. And there is still a 60% reduction in transportation emissions. And these kind of levels of reduction are, um, agree with the sort of levels of reduction that, that um, for example, the IPCC is um, suggesting. So, globally, all sector emissions targets are significantly more ambitious than aviation targets. But are there things we can do in aviation to reduce emissions? Um, there certainly are, and we're probably going to need to do all of them, pretty much. Um, so there are things like um, what we call operational measures. So often the routes that airlines fly between origin and destination is quite inefficient. They're, they're, they may be taking a lot of detours for various different reasons. So you can do some, uh, some measures that are aimed at flying just more directly, more efficiently with the aircraft that you have. Um, the, uh, this, you can implement these sort of measures very quickly. 
or fairly quickly at least, but the total benefits are relatively limited. There's what we call technological measures, so um, new engines, new airframes, etc. We have a problem here with the, the timeline of the fleet. So an aircraft in the global aviation fleet lives for about 30 years typically, which means that once you've bought your new aircraft, you want to be able to use it, or at least have other airlines use it for the full 30 years to kind of get your, get your money's worth. That means it's kind of that technology is then frozen into the fleet for 30 years. We um, have economic measures, so for example, emissions trading, could include here the, uh, the UK's um, air passenger duty, part of that. And also kind of related things such as promotion of um, teleconferencing. The mode shift, um, so for example to high speed rail, the issue with high speed rail is that um, there are only a few very specific routes where a high speed rail um, is a good substitute for an air route just because the characteristics of um, air and rail are quite different. And there's um, changing fuels, so for example, um, drop-in biofuels, which you could use in existing aircraft. Um, if you want to change the fuel more radically, then um, you may need to go back to the technological measures because you need to redesign your aircraft. However, there are a lot of um, interactions, a lot of trade-offs involved, and getting these things actually into the um, global aviation system and functioning is quite complex. So, for example, um, as the case of the design of the Airbus A380, it's quite an interesting example of a trade-off. London Heathrow has relatively strict noise requirements and is also um, a key market for the A380. It um, was identified by Airbus as, you know, we need to be able to have our aircraft land at Heathrow without any problems. To the extent that they, um, they altered the design of the A380s such that um, emissions, um, CO2 emissions, were about 2% higher than they would otherwise have been, um, so that they could meet the noise requirements. And there are plenty of other trade-offs involved in um, aircraft design as well. Following that, um, you've got the issue that you may now have your measure, you've, you've got your aircraft design, you can use it on um, a given test flight, it works great. Once you try and get it into the global aviation system, um, it may well not reduce greenhouse gases by the same amount as on your test flight. So for example, airlines may just choose not to invest. Um, airlines often don't make a lot of money, airlines go bust quite frequently. Getting them to invest in an expensive technology is quite difficult. Um, they may also choose not to invest if they believe it will make journeys longer or if it will make the journeys more uncomfortable, which is true of some technologies. The technology may not be suitable for all routes. Airlines like to be flexible and use aircraft across different routes. It may conflict with other measures. And on the flip side, if your technology is great, if it reduces airline costs by a lot because it's reducing your fuel use by so much, airlines will go, wow, we can reduce our ticket prices and more people may end up flying. So there's quite a lot of complex um, interactions. And this is the reason that um, instead of kind of just doing these sort of calculations on the back of an envelope basis, um, the UCL, UCL ATS lab is specifically trying to um, model the way that all of the different stakeholders within the aviation system interact so we can try and capture some of these effects. With the aim being of being able to go from an individual potentially great technology to how much would this actually reduce emissions in practice. So I'm going to go fairly quickly through how we actually do that. First of all, introduce UTL ATS Lab. So we've got multiple projects that look at exploring these different interactions. The one I'm going to go through most is um, AIM 2015, which is um, the integrated modelling tool that I've had a, a hand in developing got kind of a simple and a complex version of that. Um, the complex version, which was, is developed in the um, Acclaim project, additionally models um, airline behavior. And um, initially developed for investigating capacity expansion, but you can also do a lot of other things with it. And we also had a specific project looking at electric aircraft 
and how they've come into the system, of, of which more later. Plus work on a variety of other things, anything like hybrid electric aircraft, carbon leakage, rates, policy assessments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we have a website with um, lots of information and lots of papers on it. So this is what the model looks like. Um, broadly, first of all, we need to look at what is the demand. Um, so how many passengers want to go from city A to city B. Then we want to know which way would they go, which size aircraft airlines would put on for them to travel, um, how would those air air aircraft interact with the global aviation system, so what would the delay at different airports would be, which routes would they take in the air, what are the costs and emissions associated with flying them, um, which technologies would they choose if they need to purchase new aircraft, um, costs come back into what fares would they choose, so we need to solve either iteratively in the simple version or using an optimization in the more complex version. And we can then look at what are the global climate impacts, what are the noise and air quality at airports, and what are the economic impacts. So I'm going to go through these in turn um, pretty briefly. In terms of demand, um, one example would be London to Sydney. In 2015, about 200,000 people travelled London to Sydney and the number of people who want to take a particular city to city journey broadly depends on things like the population of the two cities, um, the incomes and the fare between the cities and other kind of journey characteristics, so for example time, is it a domestic flight, etc, etc. So we model this using what's called a gravity type model, it's broadly the same functional form as Isaac Newton's original gravity equation, so population is proportional to, so demand is proportional to population to some power, times income to some power, etc, etc. That will get you, um, and this is estimated from a global database of passengers, fares and routing in um, 2015 in this case. That will get you the number of passengers who want to travel London to Sydney, but um, you can't travel direct from London to Sydney. They will all have taken some route. So the next thing is an itinerary choice model, which says, OK, which route did they actually take? Did they go Heathrow to Hong Kong to Sydney? Did they go Gatwick to Dubai to Sydney? There's a lot of different alternatives. These are only the top nine. Um, so. For these, again, we use the, um, the Sabre data for uh, which routes passengers took and what fares were associated with them, and we estimate um, a logic model which captures the passenger choice between different itineraries based on their characteristics. And we also have a fare model which works out what the fares would be based on things like what are airline costs, what is the level of competition on the route, as an itinerary level. Um, this is estimated by um, Bo Jinwa, who is in the audience over here. And um, it was presented at um, TRB in 2018. OK, so now we've got the number of passengers on each itinerary. That gives us the number of passengers on a given flight leg. So for example, London to Dubai. We now want to know which size aircraft would airlines use on those legs. So this is basically another choice model estimated from global um, scheduling data. And the, um, it's based on factors such as what is the demand on the route, is a given aircraft type capable of doing that distance, and various characteristics of the airports at either end. So that, gives, that then gives you the number of flights uh, on a given flight leg, and if you sum up the number of flights at a given airport, we're also interested in delay. Um, many people are interested in delay. Specifically, we're interested in delay because if you spend your delay with the engines on, that's an extra source of CO2, NOx particulates at airports. And it also affects journey time. So people may want to avoid an airport that has particularly high delays. So this uses what's called a, um, a queuing model which is broadly based on the difference between the, um, the number of aircraft that want to use the airport and the number of, uh, and the, the capacity of the runways. That was the simple version. Um, this is the complex version. This is the only equation in the presentation. Um, 
complex version, which is um, developed by um, Carl Doyne um, at UCL, is um, so the previous version we've just got um, the aggregate of total airline behaviour. This actually models individual airlines and how they compete with each other. So airlines all want to maximise their own profit. Um, to do so, they can change their fares, they can change their flight frequency, and they can change which aircraft they use. So they have some revenue, which is fair times the number of passengers, basically. They have some per-flight related costs, and they have some per-passenger related costs. And they're trying to maximise P of the end there. And they have various constraints. So they have a constraint of airport capacity, they have a constraint of available fleet. Now, as I mentioned previously, um, so it was originally generated to study airport capacity expansion, but you can do quite a lot of other things to do with it, including evaluating different technologies. Okay, so you've now got number of flights from city A to city B, or airport A to airport B. Where do they actually go? Um, so flights don't usually follow the shortest route between an origin and a destination airport. There's various air traffic control requirements, some of which are safety requirements and you can't reduce, some of which um, you probably can reduce, so you might want to go around um, military airspace, for example, if you take off from Stansted and head eastwards, um, you'll probably be avoiding quite a lot of military airspace. Um, you might want to avoid expensive airspace, so different countries charge different amounts to fly through their own space, and you might want to avoid congested airspace as well as things like weather. You might also spend some time holding waiting to land at your um, destination airport. So some of this can be reduced, and there are schemes out there to reduce it. In Europe, there is CESAR. In um, the US, there is NextGen. Some you can't. And we use for this um, some work by Tom Reynolds, which specifically looks at radar track data to work out what is the extra distance flown. Finally, we want to know how much do these aircraft emit. Now we know how far they're going and how many people are on them. So we have a performance model which works out how much fuel aircraft use and what they emit um, by flight stage, which then affects the cost of using the aircraft, which then affects ticket prices. So this is the whole thing we need to solve. Um, we also look at fleet turnover, so when do you retire an aircraft? And we look at technology choice, so, so you're getting a new aircraft, um, what technology do you choose if you've got a choice available? And that's, um, that's using um, a net present value model. Once we've solved those, either iteratively or using optimization, we come on to the final impacts. So we've got um, for climate impacts, there's a meta model which is based upon the output of uh, a full big global climate model. Um, there's um, some noise models which have been developed by collaborators at the University of Southampton. Similarly, um, we use um, NOx NO2 PM code developed um, primarily by Stephen Barrett um, of Cambridge and now of MIT. And we have um, population impacts model. So this is an example of a population impacts model. This is Sydney Airport. The reason I keep on mentioning Sydney so often is because we like to use Australia as a kind of neat test case. It's a fairly self-contained domestic system. So this is Sydney Airport um, 2015, I think. Um, here are the runways, and these are just showing at current usage 54 decibel, 57 decibel noise contours, and NO2 contour from aircraft engines, overlaid over um, population map. So from this, we can estimate that the um, affected population And we also have um, a meta-model of airport economic impact studies, which is currently under development by um, Raphael Ida at UCL. OK, so that's how we model currently. Um, how do we model the future? There's a lot of different input variables, and some of these are going to change. In particular, the things that um, are quite likely to have a big impact on how much people want to fly in future are things like what our global population is going to do, particularly what our global incomes going to do, um, what is oil price going to do, and oil price forecasts are generally terrible. Um, similarly, what a carbon price is going to do. Um, if we're looking at electric aircraft, we also need to know things about electricity, such as carbon intensity of electricity generation. So these are all 
highly uncertain. We also, we're also interested in the characteristics of any given technology we want to model, which again is also highly uncertain. So we deal with this by using different scenarios, and in the case of the socioeconomic variables, we tend to use the um, IPCC SSP scenarios. So you can see, for, the, for example, um, these are just kind of example projections, GDP per capita, by the time you get out to 2070, the range is pretty large, and people's propensity to fly is quite sensitive to income. So you could expect that the amount people will want to fly in the future is going to be also pretty uncertain. OK, so that's how we model stuff. Next question is, what are we interested in modelling? So for this talk, I'm going to concentrate primarily on the things which could reduce aviation emissions quite a lot. So there are lots of different technologies that people are working on, some of which you know, have a small benefit in terms of emissions, some of which potentially have quite a large benefit in terms of emissions, but also associated problems with implementation. But of these, the, thing that I, the things that I'm going to concentrate on today are the areas where we could get you know, very substantial benefits. And I'm going to highlight particularly our battery and or hybrid electric um, narrow body aircraft and drop in biofuels. And both of those are particularly interesting because they can reduce emissions by a lot, but they also have um, quite stringent constraints. So, aviation biofuels. I'm going to talk primarily about drop-in biofuels. A drop-in biofuel is a fuel which you can use in existing aircraft without any modifications. So it's functionally identi identical to um, jet fuel. These are already in at least limited use in commercial flights. If you've flown out of Los Angeles International recently, um, United at LAX have an agreement with... Um, a biofuel production facility, um, Altair. They produce um, biofuel which goes directly into the Los Angeles um, airport fuel supply. And so basically all flights that are coming out of Los Angeles have some tiny percentage of biofuel in their tanks. So it's something that at least is coming into the system in a very small way already. Now, a cellulosic biomass aviation-based um, aviation fuel offers up to about an 80% reduction in fuel life cycle CO2. So fuel life cycle just means that um, we account for the, production, uh, the emissions associated with the production and transportation of the fuel um, on the ground, as well as emissions in the air. However, there are some um, large caveats. So... First of all, it's currently expensive. We'd project that to come down over time, particularly as production is scaled up. But scaling up production requires significant infrastructure investment, which requires um, somebody to be willing to put in that investment. Also, the combustion at altitude is largely unchanged. So you're still putting out the same emissions while you're in the air. The difference is that now you're growing crops to um, make the fuel, and those crops are absorbing CO2. But it means that things like NOx at altitude and contrails at altitude are still happening. Um, it also means you've still got noise, NOx, and probably a reduced level of particulate emissions at airports. And one big constraint is that the supply is very uncertain. So if you remember those projections of... Um, emissions from other sectors, emissions from the power generation sector were going basically to nothing. That assumed biofuel is going into the, um, biomass is going into the power generation sector. Similarly, there are lots of assumptions for transportation emissions that assume biomass is fueling um, road transportation. And if you look at the amount of um, biomass that's available, there may not be enough for everybody who wants it. Moving on to um, electric aircraft. First of all, battery electric aircraft. So the idea behind a battery electric aircraft is it's an aircraft that just uses batteries for power. It doesn't use jet fuel at all. 
And the reason why you might want to do this, and well, one reason why you might want to do this, is again emissions from the um, power generation sector. So this is, uh, this is some projections from EASA of the carbon intensity of electricity generation over time. Um, this solid line here is just a solid 3% um, per year decrease. These specific projections here, the dotted and dashed lines, you may notice after about 2050, go below zero. So this is negative carbon electricity. And how you do this is our old friend biomass, again, plus carbon capture and storage at um, power stations. So if you can achieve this and then power an aircraft using this electricity, you can get, in theory, a negative emission flight. And it's, it's the power generation sector that is doing all the work, but it's still fairly good. Again, this isn't a completely theoretical thing. There are multiple aircraft designs that are being development, developed and tested. There's, um, most of those are um, light aircraft. They're in the general kind of air taxi field, and it's things like um, the Airbus EFAN or the Uber Elevate project. Some of these, um, so there are 50 plus of these kind of aircraft um, projects, some of which are you know, having test flights, some of which are actually in production. There is a reason why um, it's only small aircraft at the moment, which I'll come into in a moment. But there are some um, narrow bodies, so kind of 737 or A320 size aircraft um, concepts at least. <coughs> to accompany those. OK, so why is it just a small aircraft currently? The main reason is battery energy density. So um, if you consider kind of um, current battery technologies, so laptop batteries like lithium ion, about the best you can get in terms of energy density from lithium ion is about um, 300 watt hours per kilogram. Um, theoretically, that is. Um, you can't achieve nearly that um, in practice yet. Um, if you look at what would be needed to power a narrow-body um, all-electric aircraft, um, this is some work from our collaborators at MIT, um, you need 800 or more watt-hours per kilogram for a usable range within the global aviation system. So we're not there yet, and we would have to move to new battery um, chemistries to be able to do that and you know, these are under development there's a lot of work looking into alternative um, chemistries such as lithium sulfur or lithium air but these are much more theoretical at the moment so even if you do have these improvements in battery energy density it's still likely that the aircraft is going to be range limited so batteries mean um, extra weight and the amount of energy you're able to carry means that you're likely to only be able to fly um, short haul, or currently short haul flights. There are other issues to do with things like battery specific power, so you need enough power to be able to take off. And if you don't want noise to get worse, you need to be able to take off and get out of the way relatively quickly. And it's also likely that all electric aircraft are going to need um, advances in cooling system technology and there's also a number of questions to do with how you actually charge them up. How long does it take? Do you swap in new batteries? What's the cost associated with that? So one way of kind of reducing um, or taking away a bit of the range constraint would be to look at hybrid electric aircraft. Again, there are um, various projects looking at what you know, would be feasible hybrid electric aircraft designs. So here you use jet fuel and a battery. Um, and you can use the fuel to generate electricity to power electric propulsors. So if you've got jet fuel and a battery, um, your range constraint is a bit less. One example would be this design. Um, so this is from a NASA, um, NASA and Boeing project. It's the N plus three um, sugar bolt design. And they reckon that you can get up to about a 70% reduction in fuel burn for a comparable flight uh, from here 2008 technology at short range with somewhat smaller benefits once you get up to um, a longer range. 
So, final part of the presentation is how and whether these technologies can affect global emissions. So I'm going to present results from um, three different studies that we've done. The first is broadly looking at biofuels. Um, what we did here is to run the um, aviation integrated model from um, 2015 out to um, 2070, um, giving airlines the option of a wide range of alternative technologies, so things like um, BWB here is blended wing body aircraft, um, contra-rotating propeller engines, but in particular the thing that makes the biggest difference out of all of the different things we looked at is biofuels. So I've put, this one is with biofuels, there is also a without biofuels. And the idea here is that technologies are only adopted if they are cost effective for airlines under the um, scenario conditions that we look at. We also include a cost curve model for biofuels which takes some account of what the supply is and um, what the costs associated with biofuels would be. Although we do assume that aviation gets some level of priority in using the biomass. And we run across a range of these um, IPCC SSP scenarios for things like population and income that I mentioned. So first of all, passenger kilometres, as you can see by 2070, there is a pretty massive range, but they're all um, generally going up. And this is because, you know, primarily because income is generally going up in the different scenarios. So we see a range of about three to five, um, five and a half percent per year growth in passenger kilometres, which is you know, broadly around this four to five percent per year I mentioned from the, um, the Airbus and Boeing projections. If we look at what um, fuel life cycle CO2 is doing, this is uh, over here. So this is with biofuels and this is without biofuels. You can see in the without biofuels case, again, everything is going up. It's going up less fast than the passenger kilometres, but it's still going up um, in the uh, low demand growth case. So this is kind of slow income growth. Uh, we're still seeing nearly a doubling in emissions to 2070. And in the high demand growth case, we're seeing much more than that. With biofuels, however, we do see a reasonably long period of carbon neutral growth. And this is the, um, kind of the time period over which um, the biofuels come into the system. And about at the end of the, this period of um, carbon neutral growth is when you kind of run out of um, extra potential to add biofuels. So in this case, we're still seeing emissions in 2017, which are greater than those in 2015. But um, yeah. if it's a low income growth scenario, then potentially we get broadly carbon neutral growth. Again, we still can't achieve that in the high um, income growth scenario. That was biofuels. That's, um, so that previous um, simulation didn't include electric aircraft of any sort, either battery electric or hybrid electric. So um, we did look at battery electric aircraft in a study we did fairly recently in um, Nature Energy. Um, so this, um, this figure again, this time not an animation, gives you an idea of where you can use the electric aircraft. So I mentioned before, the range dependence is very important. If you make an electric aircraft and it can only go 600 nautical miles, which is perfectly likely for maybe the first generation of electric aircraft, which might come in, say, 2050 or so, then it can do these yellow routes here. Um, so it'll be very kind of small, localised networks. If you can manage a bit more than that, your networks are still quite localised. Um, and probably they're not likely to get for a very long time an electric aircraft that is able to do any of the intercontinental routes. But unfortunately, the intercontinental routes are where the, um, a lot of the growth is occurring at the moment. So you can take this information and put it into a cumulative diagram of um, what proportion of global totals of things like departures, CO2, etc., um, are done by a distance. So if you've got a, um, an electric aircraft which can do, say, 900 nautical miles, that's about here, um, you can do about 70% of, you can substitute about 70% of global flight departures, which sounds great. 
Unfortunately, the long haul flights are where most of the emissions are, so you can only do about 30% um, of global fuel use with your 900 nautical mile electric aircraft. So, electric aircraft can have a massive impact on compatible route CO2 on these short haul routes. If you look at, for example, small narrow bodies, so say kind of A319 type um, route, um, this is just running electric aircraft through um, the global aviation simulation model. Um, you're seeing perhaps a 50% a decrease in emissions over the case without electric aircraft and an absolute decrease from year 2015 <coughs> levels. But unfortunately, the compatible routes don't account for very many, um, very much of the global CO2. So what we may end up seeing is only about a 10 to 15 percent reduction on a global level from the non-electric baseline. That doesn't mean that electric aircraft are in, unimportant. They're probably very important as part of a basket of future measures. And they're probably very important on an individual airport level in that if you are if you are an airport that primarily does short haul flights and you switch over to all electric flights, then you know, you've cut out contrails for those flights, you've cut out local knocks, there's um, no local PM, and noise is likely to decrease. So on an individual airport level, you're potentially doing great. Also, the extra electricity demand from using these aircraft is relatively small, so you've estimated if you can electrify all routes under about 600 nautical miles, that would add less than 2% to global electricity demand. So, coming on finally to hybrid electric aircraft, um, this is an interesting study, um, and it's kind of looking at it from the other direction. So, instead of saying, okay, we've got this technology, we know its characteristics, will it come into the aviation system, will airlines adopt it? Instead, we're saying, what do the characteristics of a hybrid electric aircraft need to be, to be um, best adopted by airlines? And here, we, because we're using the, um, the full airline behavior model, we're running it on our kind of test case area, which is Australia. So there are lots of demand, um, there are lots of um, design decisions that you need to make <coughs> when designing a, an a hybrid electric aircraft in particular. How much of the power do you provide using jet fuel? How much, um, how much battery capacity do you put onto it? And these affect what the maximum range of the aircraft is. So what I'm going to show here is um, some examples for hybrid, hybrid electric aircraft designs with different um, maximum ranges. And the idea is if you've got a hybrid electric aircraft design that has um, a very big maximum range, um, that aircraft is going to have to be primarily powered by jet fuel. It's not going to be very different to um, uh, existing alternative technologies that um, are powered by jet fuel. If, if, on the other hand, you optimize it for a short range, you can put more battery power on it. That means that the fuel burn benefits are going to be greater. But on the other hand, you can use it for fewer routes. So this is 1,500 kilometer range. This is um, fairly short, so this aircraft can't do most of these routes. Um, in green, uh, where the hybrid electric aircraft is being used, in black is where it's not being used. But it is being used a lot on the um, Melbourne to Sydney route. <coughs> then if you go up to 2,500, um, gradually you're starting to see it's being used on longer routes. Um, go up a bit further, start to see a few extra routes, but also the usage on Melbourne to Sydney is going down. And the reason the usage to Melbourne to Sydney is going down is because now you've got less benefit in this aircraft design compared to conventional technology. Um, so airlines are less likely to be able to improve their profits by adopting it. And if you go right up to 4,500 kilometres, you now can use it on those long haul routes but um, because the fuel burn benefits are less, you start to see it not being used on some of the um, major intercity routes where it was previously being taken up. 
So overall, what do we see in terms of system-wide um, fuel use reductions? So you remember that chart before I was showing you, it was saying kind of up to about a 70% reduction um, for short-haul flights in terms of fuel use for a particular hybrid electric aircraft design. What we see in this study is up to about 20% um, system-wide from the case where the hybrid electric aircraft isn't included. And the reason why it's 20% things like um, there are various trade-offs to be made with design versus things like range. And also, not all of the airlines <coughs> are purchasing these aircraft. They're not using them on all of their routes just because the aircraft is not capable of doing a particular route or because they can't make money by using it on a particular route. So, I did ask a question in the title of the talk. Um, I should probably answer it. Having been through all those different simulations, how low can we actually go in terms of aviation emissions? So, for an individual flight, the outlook is quite rosy. For an individual flight, we can get 80 or more percent reductions in fuel life cycle CO2. And that will be from things like um, if you can run it on 100% biofuel or if it's a short haul flight and um, you're in 2050 and you've got an electric aircraft that you can use on it. For global aviation, the, pictures is, the picture is more complex. So broadly, if you're trying to stabilize emissions, so if you're going for, as um, ICAO would like, carbon neutral growth, um, that's broadly possible within the aviation sector to um, 2060, say. If GDP growth is you know, on the mid to low end of what is projected, if there is enough biomass supply that is specifically available for aviation to substitute maybe... Um, 50%-ish of fossil aviation fuel, maybe perhaps a bit less. If future fossil fuel prices, um, once you factored in carbon prices, are at least above present levels, and if um, the current projected improvements in um, global operations, global technologies, are realised. So, so the benefits we've seen from some of the simulations assume quite a lot of other small-scale improvements in different areas that are all being worked on at the moment. What about if we want to reduce emissions for, from current levels? That's possible. There are scenarios where we can do that. Um, I would say it's possible if additionally there is a bit more biomass available for aviation, in particular so that we can substitute um, most or all of the fuel from long-haul flights. And if additionally we either have even more biomass for short-haul flights, or we're able to um, use electric aircraft for short-haul flights. And finally, on a, just to end on a reasonably optimistic note, and say that um, one of the things we have assumed throughout the simulations we do is that technologies are only adopted if they are you know, cost-effective for airlines to purchase. And Generally, over most of the future projections we see, these technologies are cost effective. So, if we can actually get them working, then there is reasonable hope that they will get into the system. Okay, um, thank you very much. I'll leave you with our list of um, collaborators. And thank you for coming along. Thank you very much, Lynette, for a very comprehensive presentation. Surely there are questions in the audience. Gentlemen in the back. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah that's very interesting. My name is Leon DeMarco. I'm really I'd just like to mention two other possible ways of doing this. One of them is to make synthetic fuels using electricity. You know, carbon comes from sucking carbon dioxide out of the air, which we can do now. We know how to do it. There are about 10 machines that, that do that. It's actually, it looks like it's going to be cheaper to reverse the combustion process using hydrogen from water to make hydrocarbons than make biofuels. But of course, there's no biomass limit on that. And you use a lot less land. So the only limit you've got on is renewable electricity. But actually, there's another method of doing it, which is using the carbon, if you take the carbon dioxide out of the air, bury it 
you create a carbon offset. So you can offset the emissions which are created by the flights. And we, we, we think in fact we're pretty certain we can do that now for under $50 a ton. To give you an idea of what that means, London to New York flight per seat is about half a ton of CO2. So you could do that for roughly $25 a seat, which is say 10% of the, the flight cost. And those two methods look, and I, I, I think actually offsetting is the one that's likely to win out there, look like uh, very suitable ways of, of cancelling virtually all, all, all of the emissions, CO2 emissions. Oh, that's uh, interesting. If you let me know uh, a reference for uh, for those, yeah, let's have a look at this. Yes, please. Uh, <coughs> I don't know. Transport studies, UCL. So your discussion of the growth of demand didn't distinguish between business and leisure travel. But most air travel is leisure travel. Yep. And I suppose it's more price sensitive. And in the situation in which you've got a major externality, carbon, which you're not price immediately, shouldn't you really be paying more attention to the pricing structure in a situation where the technology development is quite difficult? I can tell you precisely why I wasn't going into too much detail on business and leisure, tra leisure passengers. It is because um, it's quite difficult to get global level data on business and leisure passengers. So I mean, we've kind of looked a bit at can we um, do latent variable models where we don't actually have to know beforehand what the exact split is to be able to distinguish between the different groups of passengers. But generally, we estimate our models just assuming one group of passengers just because we don't have data on the individual passengers. But you are quite correct. There are you know, different components of aviation demand and, um, and certainly some different behavior between leisure passengers and business passengers. Um, we do estimate um, on parameters separately for um, short haul and long haul flights, and this actually captures some of the variation. But, um, but and we, when we look at um, putting a carbon price into the system, so I didn't go into it in detail, but there is some of the um, some of the models we run do put um, carbon prices in, and we would expect that to change a, a little bit if we were um, separately modelling. Um, business and leisure passengers. But I think primarily um, because leisure passengers are you know, the larger group, um, the parameters that we have in primarily um, capture their behaviour. Paul. Yeah, Paul Eakins from the Institute of Sustainable Resources. Thank you very much for that. It was great. Um, when you're projecting your increases in demand from increases in income. What proportion of that is due to the fact that people fly more? And what proportion of it is due to an expansion of business class? Because it's quite clear to me that business class is growing very fast, um, just anecdotally when I walk on an aircraft, and that takes about three times the space of an economy class seat. So how are you uh, factoring in the growth of business class? Oh, that's an interesting question because um so, certainly on some aircraft, the, um, the business class section is growing, so if you like, there's more, more air, airplane real estate per passenger. If you look on an aggregate basis across the global um, aviation fleet, there is some evidence that there hasn't actually been um, a very large shift in the number, average number of seats per aircraft. And then it's likely to be the fact that you know, on some aircraft, you're getting more seats for business passengers. On some other aircraft, um, you're jamming more passengers in and you know, trying to do low-cost long haul, for example. So um, and it's a thing we've uh, looked at, um, and I've seen a few presentations on. Um, it looks like overall, if you take the different trends within the system, um, on average, there isn't um, a long-term trend there, at least at the moment. Yes, please. That is a little outside my area, I'm afraid. So that you'd have to talk to our MIT collaborators. <laughs>
I, um, my name is Chidi Oti Obihara. Um, up until last year, I was finance coordinator of the Green Party. So I'm interested in the policy side of your excellent presentation. Could you talk in a bit more detail about what you meant by an 80% reduction in life cycle CO2? And if you can also expand in terms of what you see potential policy, government policy, that might support more progressive use or more progressive reductions in, in CO2 emissions and aviation. Um, so in terms of the 80% reduction in life cycle CO2, so when I talk about fuel life cycle CO2, I'm talking about um, CO2 <coughs> from the production of the fuel, the transportation of the fuel, and the actual burning of the fuel in the aircraft. So in the case of um, our traditional um, aviation fuel from fossil sources, life cycle CO2 is about 15% um, 15, um, 15 more than um, the total CO2 from just burning the fuel in the aircraft. The 80% reduction comes, for example, um, when you use biofuels, you're still emitting the same amount out of the back of the aircraft, but um, the biomass that you use to make the fuel is absorbing CO2 as it grows. In the case of an electric aircraft, the situation is slightly different. Um, you're not emitting anything out of the back of the aircraft, um, but then the generation of the electricity and uh, transportation, effectively, of the electricity is um, associated itself with some level of emissions. In terms of um, policies that you could use to promote uses of these technologies, so use of electric aircraft, use of biofuels, I think at the moment, in terms of biofuels, probably useful policies would be things like um, support for biofuel demonstration facilities, developing biofuel plants. Generally, anything which can be used to make the technology more mature, to bring down the cost associated with producing it, and to normalize its use um, within the aviation system. Similarly, with electric aircraft, at the moment, I think primarily the kind of policy actions that are going to make a difference at the moment are to do with um, funding research and development into the various technology challenges that are involved. Once the technologies are yeah. out there and available, then if they're going to come into the aviation system, they need to be cost effective for airlines to use in comparison to the, uh, the conventional technology that they're compared with. And at that point, uh, may be interested in things like um, carbon pricing, for example. A supplementary question. You tried to ask a question before, already. Yes. Um, Billboard has used for buildings trust. I mean, it seems to be an enormous elephant in the room here, which is climate change. And it seems to me that really what we need is a massive social movement to get on aeroplanes less, because it seems to be a lot of flying is completely unnecessary. Oh, and certainly we could reduce emissions by flying less. Generally, and if you look at research about you know, how well do voluntary measures do, if you like, how well does asking people, for example, to, um, to offset their emissions um, voluntarily if they want to by themselves do. And it has a great benefit for an individual person in terms of the amount of CO2 they produce. But if you look on a system-wide basis, not very many people actually do it, unfortunately. So um, certainly if you want to fly less, we would need some level of societal change. From the state of the world at the moment, um, we would need, you know, people's choices would need to change quite a lot. And at the moment, there isn't really the evidence there that enough people would do that um, to make a large difference in emissions, unfortunately. Yes, please. So, I mean, you mentioned that your model was, I mean, the technology would be uptaken if it's cost-effective, cost-competitive. 
Uh, my question is, or could you walk us through how you model the cost? Because uh, I feel like it's an important thing, and it's technologies that are not there. There is no sort of history behind it. How do you? Do Absolutely, you know, there, there are certainly large uncertainties in the costs associated with, associated with different technologies. So there's, um, now I've mentioned that we, we run different scenarios for um, socioeconomic variables. We also run different scenarios for um, technology characteristics. So primarily, it depends on the technology. If there is literature there, we tend to go to the literature and look at estimates that people have already made of how much different technologies cost. So you can look at things like um, you know, what a battery costs at the moment, what do we think they're going to do into the future, um, how would things like the, um, the landing cost at airports change for using a battery electric aircraft, which is maybe quieter but also maybe heavier. Um, we can look at various other things to do with how technologies in the past have been um, costed by airlines. And putting all of these things together, we can kind of come up with a range of what we think, for example, the, um, the list price of, say, an electric aircraft would be um, in the most optimistic case and the most pessimistic case. And similarly, what we think the, um, the usage costs associated with, say, an electric aircraft or a blended wing body aircraft or an aircraft that uses contra-rotating propeller engines would be. And we then put these ranges into the model, and we run, you know, in the central case, um, with optimistic assumptions and with pessimistic assumptions. So when I've um, come to conclusions here, they, they include that range of um, different scenarios. Say a little bit more about what your assumptions are in terms of biomass availability for your modeling and what how they compare to assessments of global availability or national availability. Um, they are from assessments of global availability. Um, I forget the exact reference, um, but there is, there is a reference to it in the, um, the paper I mentioned, so the Dre et al. 2018, which was um, a transportation right. research so, record. So those global paper. availability in terms of general biomass, in terms of biomass for aviation, or is um, they, are, they are for um, general availability of biomass, so we have assumed in these model runs that because aviation is so difficult to decarbonise compared to other sectors, that it will have some amount of priority in terms of the amount of biomass it gets. And, and the priority can be reflected in the market price and the willingness to pay. Right? Yeah, so, I see. Um, yes, please. Hi, um, Daniel Scanner from UCL. Uh, two questions you mentioned about long-haul flights growing. Um, have you actually modeled that in terms of how much you expect long-haul flights to, to grow in terms of numbers you get? Um, secondly, um, there are some low drag, uh, low drag uh, aircraft designs, you mentioned them wing designs. Do you foresee any of those kind of really low drag aircraft designs coming into usage which could help them increase range? Um, and so Certainly in terms of, um, for example, blended wing body aircraft, in the simulations where we put in blended wing body aircraft, we do see some usage of those in the, um, particularly in the, the longer haul sectors, um, as in at the, um, at the costs that we assume, it does seem that um, they're likely to be cost effective. If the technology gets developed is another thing, which obviously depends on decisions made by Airbus and Boeing, for example. In terms of the growth of long-haul flights, um, I actually did have a figure in here which I took out to make the presentation shorter, which showed it, I'm afraid. I don't remember the exact amount that was changing, but I think it was maybe the share of longer-haul flights was changing by of order about 10% over the time period of the simulation. I would have to look that up to tell you exactly. Uh, Hector was a common trust. Um, there's been some renewed interest in supersonic flight. Is that something that you think would realistically be readopted? And what do you think its effects on emissions would be? Um, we've actually, um, we actually did a little bit of work 
with MIT um, looking at this, and looking at some of the um, supersonic aircraft designs that have been talked about. Um, certainly, in terms of emissions, um, it would be you know, a return of supersonic flight would likely lead to an increase in emissions. There's not really much getting around that. Is it likely? Um, I believe that the general idea behind the supersonic aircraft designs at the moment is that they'd be looking at you know, ultra-rich passengers for whom you know, getting long distances very quickly is a priority. There's a lot of technological work that needs to be done about things like um, the noise associated with supersonic aircraft and where you're able to, adopt, um, where you're able to use them. And I'm not completely sure that all of that work is yet um, finalised. But broadly, it depends on <coughs> what you think the behaviour and priorities of the ultra-rich are likely to be. And certainly there is a market segment there who would probably like to do it. But are there enough people to make it economic to develop and produce an aircraft? Um, Probably not, I would say, but you never know. I think the gentleman, you tried to say something before. Yeah, yeah I, just, I just wanted to ask about the uh, land footprint of scenarios like the stabilization of emissions by mid-century for the biomass. What kind of area um, is required to produce that amount of uh, biomass fuel? <laughs> Um, I would have to go back to the source papers um, that we used to get the, um, the supply curves for that. But um, <coughs> specifically, what we're looking at here is um, not biomass that competes with food for land area, because we're specifically looking at cellulosic biomass, um, which is grown on non-food producing land. But the area would be large. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's it. Three more questions, and then we proceed to the reception, and then everybody has a chance over there to uh, ask and let any remaining um, questions. Yes, please. Uh, when we talk about biofuels, we always hear like land use, but I've come across a lot of like indirect impacts, such as making it compatible with jet fuel or like engines right now. We use dichloromethane, which has a lot of like health impacts and also the greenhouse gas. So how big a talent are you indirect in the process of making it And as far as I'm aware, the, uh, the amount of additives you need are, are relatively small. So um, they're fairly small compared to the overall benefits of um, using biomass. Certainly you do need to use a few different additives, particularly if you want to use 100% biofuels to make them compatible with um, aircraft engines as they currently are. But in general, the effect of the additives is less than the benefits that you're getting from using the biofuel. Yes, please. Um, you mentioned about incentivizing the use of new technologies and also at the start you talked about um, the impact that Heathrow had on the development of the A380 and what their ambitions were. How much does the airline charge, like landing and departure charges, impact the airline choice? Have you been able to work that in? Um, and that's certainly something that we've um, we've had a bit of a look at. So this is more a question for the um, for like the the airline behaviour model, and it's something that we certainly haven't you know run all of the way through the behaviour model, but there are certainly cases where an airport's decision of how to set their landing charges um, has affected which airlines use the airport, and if airlines you know, considered moving some of their flights to other airports. So I think one example is um, Stansted Airport and Ryanair, for example. So certainly, yeah. decisions made by individual airports can have impacts beyond those airports, and in the case of um, Heathrow, um, potentially globally. And generally, for things where um, 
for decisions that actually affect aircraft design, you would be looking at only you know, very important major global airports. And I've seen, I think I've seen as well as Heathrow, there was, I've seen some specific discussion of um, changes in um, aircraft design requirements being set by places like um, Orange County Airport, specifically because it's you know, a busy airport which has very strict um, noise requirements. But in general, for any given random small airport, probably they wouldn't be able to do something like that. Last question. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering if you took into account like, the impact of AI on low-carbon emissions. Um, uh, not. I guess for, for, for aviation, currently, AI is not projected to have that much of an impact. So I suppose there is the issue of um, you know, potentially autonomous air taxis sometime in the future. But in what we're looking at here is primarily to do with um, large scale, longer distance passenger flights. Certainly, you know, if technologies, if kind of air taxi technologies become very popular in future, that would be another source of aviation emissions. And it's one that we don't specifically model here because they wouldn't really be using traditional airports to operate. But if you like, that's one of the, the risks on the, um, the upside of aviation emissions would be something like that occurring. Okay, um, I think in the interest of time and in the interest of us having a glass of wine with you, Lynette, uh, thank you very much again for your presentation. Thank you. And that will be available outside uh, to answer any remaining questions. Thank you.